Hello and welcome to the first episode of our 3D printing workshop here at SimScale. Thank you very much for joining this workshop session. We will today uh, make a trip through the idea of engineering simulation and try to improve together the first part of the rewrap 3D printer design. Before we actually start to dive into this very interesting topic, I would like to check if the audio on the uh, broadcasting is working for all of you. So uh, there is a button you have which is called raise your hand. And there you can give me a sign that, that something is working or not. So I would ask you to raise, press this raise your hand button in the case you can hear me. Great, I see the first hands. Great, seems like it's working for you all. Great. In the case you, you get some troubles with, with the audio connection or the, the broadcasting in general, please try to rejoin the session. And we are also providing uh, toll-free dial-in numbers, which you can use to, to hear the, the sound of this broadcast over your phone. These numbers uh, are included in the email you got some days ago, and there's also an alternative to get access to the audio of this broadcast. Great. Yes, and first of all, maybe let's just take a, a rough overview about uh, yes our current session and the next sessions we will have together. As I mentioned, the idea of, of this workshop series to, to introduce you all to engineering simulation and to show you how you can use this knowledge later on to improve your products like 3D printers. And since there is a big, big open source movement right now, we will um, try to improve uh, open source uh, 3D printer design using simulations. And uh, in the next weeks, three weeks, we will uh, take a look at, at a different part. Today we'll talk about the extruder. Next week we will investigate the vibrations of the printer frame and the March, a third of March, we will try to optimize the cooling airflow through the printer. printer. And our today's agenda is, first of all, I will give you a, a very crisp introduction to some fundamentals of 3D printing, which are important to understand. On the one hand, the physics of the simulation we will perform later, but also to understand why or how the simulation can help us to improve our product. Later on, we will together set up the, uh, uh, do the simulation setup on the SimScale platform, discuss a little bit about the results, and I will present a homework assignment to you which you can do to qualify some, to some, for some very nice prices. And finally, for sure, we will have time for questions and answers. But first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Milad. I'm working here at SunScale as a marketing program manager. Therefore, uh, I'm responsible for, for all the new users. Uh, and my job is to make SimScale or to help that SimScale become the on place for engineering simulation where everybody can learn, use, uh, and perform simulations. Um, I have a mechanical engineering background, majoring also in simulation technology. And I am, um, yes, a simulation engineer for more than 10 years. And I, yes, therefore learned a lot of different tools and, and ways how to use simulation. And I would love to share this knowledge with you today. Um, because a lot of people ask, just again, what is the idea of this workshop? Our aim is really to give you uh, some first insights, uh, what simulation can do, how you can use it, and to help especially those people uh, who are um, yes interested in designing their own 3D printer and want to use simulation to improve it. Therefore, we will give you some first hands-on experience with simulation and um, it's a very good introduction. Nevertheless, this is not a detailed training about simulation theory. If you're really interested in the fundamentals of, of simulation codes and tools, uh, there are a lot of very good books I could recommend to you. Or in the case you're a student, I'm quite sure that university is also offering course about numerics or computational mechanics. And this is also not a detailed training about the practical generation in general. Um, since this is very focused on drones. So in the case uh, you really want a, let's say, long introduction to simulation technology in general or how to use SimSkill for your daily work, we are offering for this a professional training. Uh, and you guys can also win this free professional training with a value of 500 euros. Uh, and the only thing you have to do for this is submitting your homework 
for the all the three sessions. We will later talk about how to do that. And this is a really great chance. So I would really love to see a lot of homework submissions. And because a lot of people ask us why we are offering this workshop, the, the first reason is that uh, we are a very young company and we want to, to spread out this, this word to, to bring simulation to every engineering uh, uh, workspace in the world. And therefore, it's a big pleasure for us just to give the introduction to interested engineers and designers and users. On the other hand, we would also appreciate to get your feedback. What is, is there something you very you like very much about the platform? Something you you think we should improve? Just let me know. And we would also love to see a lot maybe of, of nice new uh, public projects. Um, so if you have an idea, just uh, send me the link and we will also promote all your ideas and your projects. Yes, now let's talk a little bit in general about this workshop series before we actually start to dive in into the topic. As I mentioned, this workshop series is, is based on three one-hour online webinar session like this. After every session you will get the optional homework assignment and also some resources and help for this homework like tutorial, etc. And when you do all this homework assignments, you submit them all, then you can qualify for a free professional training uh, with a value of 500 euro. And therefore, you just have to share your homework using a, a kind of form where you just copy the link of your project and, and, and your email address. And later on, I, I will also show you uh, how to share your homework. Yes, and there were a lot of questions which were asked a lot of times in the past. So first of all, will this workshop be recorded? And the good news is yes, we will record all the sessions and provide you with them uh, after the session. Um, also, a lot of people ask me if they have to start to simulate during the session, and that is not the case. So please just listen, ask your questions, and later on you will have more than one week time to submit your homework. Uh, if you want to know how you can simulate, you just have to wait on it. I will show it to you. And in the case you need support, there are a lot of different opportunities. First of all, we have our forum. And in our SimScale forum, there is a special section just about this workshop series where you can ask all your questions and you will get their immediate help. And this is also the first place where you should go if you have troubles with setting up your simulation. And if you want to learn more about the topics we're covering here, just consult our, our documentation, our forum, and the lot of other resources uh, we are providing to, to learn simulation. Yes, and first of all, 3D printing um, is a very, very uh, big topic. And it's very important to know some fundamentals. Therefore, maybe first of all, I would like to introduce to you the 3D printer we're talking today about and how is 3D printers working. So you may hear about 3D printers in the past and this 3D printing technology is its not really, really new. It's used for more than 30 years now in industry. And in the last years, there was a movement called the RepRap movement and they started to design and publish the first open source 3D printing concept. So here you can see six different versions of, of products which were developed within this rewrap project. These are all 3D printers and all these 3D printers are, are based on melting plastic. And you can see there's a lot of different ways how to, to build such a printer. But basically all of them are sharing the same function principle. And today we will try to improve the so-called manual printer, which is uh, also a 3D printer out of the rewrap project. And uh, step by step, we will improve several parts of this printer. And this rewrap project is really awesome. You should check it out. It's www.rewrap.org. And there you can also access all the blueprints, the documentation, if you are interested to build such a printer yourself. And the greatest thing about this printer is that it's duplicating itself. It's, if you take a closer look, you can see here that these printers are all very, have very, very, very simple, simple uh, design. And uh, in the end, all the parts you can not buy in every store can be printed uh, with the printer itself. So you can reprint your printer. First of all, let's talk about the fundamentals of 3D printing. Just imagine, the idea is very easy. And a 3D printer, as the name says, is like a standard printer you use uh, in your office. 
just working three-dimensional. And in the end, if you take a look, this image is illustrating how most of or how most of the uh, reweb printers are working. For sure, there are also uh, other ways to or other uh, ways to manufacture something with CV printing, but this is the most common one. The idea is, let's say you have the three-dimensional object, and now you want to build it up. And what you do in the end, you are uh, uh, splitting up the three-dimensional object into slices, and then you are printing slice by slice. And so you are building up the three-dimensional object out of two-dimensional slices, and you're starting with the bottom, and then you're building it up step by step. And this function principle is used by, let's say, 90% of the printers, and there are a lot of different technologies following them, like, for example, what we are today doing, uh, or talking about printers using a, a, an ABS, which are melting ABS to, 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 to build up the slices. There are other printers using metal powder. And uh, the rewrap printer in general, and the printer we will uh, take a look at in the next few weeks, is working, as I mentioned, with ABS. And in the end, this 3D printer is nothing more than a combination of a, uh, let's say, three-dimensional robotic arm or, or a plus um, uh, a machine which can melt plastic. And in detail, this melting process is very important for the quality of your print. And this is also the part we will take a look today. So here you can see um, this, this extruder, which is based on open source design of the Reverb project. And in the end, this extruder is made out of three different components. You have, first of all, you have this, this main body with cooling, with a cooler, with that kind of heat sink. And you putting in this plastic wire, ABS wire here. And then you are heating up here at this part B. You're heating up this part using electric resistor. And this heat is then used to melt the plastic. And at the end, you have, which is called here A, a nozzle. And that allows you to melt this, this uh, plastic wire in a very specific way and to create very exact uh, points out of plastic. And in the end, and this is maybe also a very important point, uh, this has to be controlled somehow. And it's working like um, you have a resistor and a sensor. Resistor is just like this red thing, it's just a kind of wire which becomes very hot because of the high resistance of the material. And the sensor is just a thermostructural element which is changing its own resistance depending on the temperature. And then you are putting in this small hole the sensor and this big hole the resistor. Now the resistor is heating up and this heat is transferred through this assembly of the extruder. And then the, with this um, thermal sensor, you're measuring in the end uh, um, the temperature at another point. And now what the printer or the control of the printer is doing, he is just measuring all the time the, the resistance of the sensor. From this, he can calculate the temperature in the knee of the sensor. And then, in the end, you are changing the, or, and this is done a lot of thousand times per second, you are changing the, the, um, the power which you are applying on this resistor. So you are changing in the end the heat. And as long as the temperature is too low, you will increase the voltage. When the temperature becomes too high, you will decrease the voltage. And that's with this kind of closed feedback loop, that's the way how you are controlling in the end the temperature of this nozzle or of this extruder. And since you cannot directly control it, you cannot steer it, you're more like controlling it using a feedback loop, it is very important to, to have the right position and the, uh, uh, for the sensor. And that's also the point where simulation begins to play a role. Because here you can just do a thermal simulation and investigate how the temperature distribution 
uh, on the position of the sensor here changes depending on the temperature of the resistor. And that allows us, on the first, uh, first of all, to improve the design of this whole extruder, but also to, to get more insights about how the temperature distribution is changing with the, with the uh, temperature of the resistor and it will help us to, to tune this whole control loop. Yes, and for this we will perform right now a thermal simulation. Um, and this is divided into three steps, we can say. First of all, we have to upload a CAD model, a solid CAD model of our extruder to the SimScale platform. And this is also a very important point. Engineering simulation is very complex. The math, the, 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 the math and the physics behind this is quite complex. And to put it in easy words, the simulations are based on equations and models which you cannot solve analytically. You can just solve numerically. And therefore, it's like you as a user have to control and to tell SimScale or your code how we should solve the simulation. And for this you have to create the so-called mesh, that is, you can see it here in this middle middle image, um, which is dividing the volume of the part into a lot of small sub-volumes. And the density of this mesh, the local density of these nodes are corresponding um, with the accuracy of the simulation. And so first of all, you have to define and create this mesh and to tell the simulation tool where you want which accuracy. Then you have to set up the, the, the so-called boundary condition. That means the interaction of your model with the environment. And then finally, you get your results, which you can use for your design decisions then. And first of all, we will now perform the simulation on our own, starting with the upload of the CAD model. So here, let's go on www.simscale.com then click on login and in the case you have no SimScale account just sign up for absolutely free yes. and now we are in the so-called dashboard here I can see my own projects clicking here on public projects we can also see all public projects of other users but we will right now create a new project. Let's call it 3D printer extruder. Read the description. And you can also choose a category. Here it's manufacturing, and then we can choose the CAD file. And now the CAD model will be uploaded, and SimScale will also create a new project, which is right now private, by the way. So only I can see it. Great, then we can open the project. That sometimes can take a second. And now here is the 3D model of our extruder. And here now you can see the different parts which I was talking about. This is this main metal body. Here we have this um, this cooler. This the reason why we need this cooling, by the way, is that. We want to have a high but very homogeneous um, heat distribution in the near of the nozzle, but we don't want to have a high temperature far away from this nozzle because that can create problems. Because you know this ABS wire is not like uh, completely strong and then melting; it's more like a process. And if the temperature is too high, it can become um, a problem, and then you get some melting processes too early. And if the distribution is too bad or too cold, it will not melt right. So it's very important to have here the right distribution.
Okay, and next thing we have to do, or first thing that is say we have to do is now to create a mesh after we can see here our uh, so let's um, create a new mesh. And first of all, what we have to do is to choose the base or the geometry we want to mesh. And as I mentioned, the role of this mesh is in the end to define where we want to have a high resolution for the simulation. So next we have to choose uh, um, a meshing operation we want to perform. And here we will choose the so-called fully automatic generalization. And next of all, we have to define only two parameters. This meshing is a very, also can be a very complex process. You can also do all the meshing uh, completely manually, but we have this automatic tool for meshing. So let's just choose uh, first order. This is, we don't talk about very more detail about the merits. You can just leave first order. Then we will choose um, level three for the fineness of the mesh. And we will use for computing costs, so four processors will be used later on to calculate this meshing process. And once this is done, we can just press the Start button, and the mesh will be generated in the next minutes and seconds. And right now, everything which is which is happening is done on our cloud infrastructure. So we not we do not do not use your local computing power but our unlimited cloud computing power, which makes some skills working independent from your local IT infrastructure. Great, so let's do a quick wrap up. What I just showed you, I showed you how to create a new project, how to upload a CAD model, and how to create the automatic tetrahedral meshing process. We also talked about the two main parameters for this automatic meshing tool, which were fineness and um, number of processors. And there are a lot of advanced topics. For example, um, first of all, mesh setup can also be done manually. And for some more complex geometries, um, you have to do it manually because the automatic mesher is not strong enough and robust enough. Also, very important point is the so called CAD cleaning and preparation. The CAD model I'm using right now, which we will also provide you with later on, is let's say a clean model. Uh, it's a closed, uh, closed uh, shape, it's watertight, it's a solid model, and it does not contain small faces, edges, etc. And a lot of cases it's necessary to prepare the CAD model before uploading it to SimScale. If you're interested in this, you should really take a look at our documentation. And finally, there's also something we call mesh quality assessment. Even if your meshing worked and you got a mesh, this does not mean that your simulation will work because the mesh also should have some quality. When we talk about quality, we are referring, for example, uh, on the skewness of the cells of this, this mesh structure. And if they are very skewed, the cells, that can cause problems. And this is something which is also very advanced. For most of the simulation, you should not care for it, but anytime you get a lot of troubles, check the mesh before. Okay, now the, our mesh is still uh, in this com computing stage, but I've prepared already a project where we have the final mesh and where we can directly take a look at the final mesh. So let's now see if everything worked. And here you can see the mesh now, and yes, every solid body was meshed on its own. So we can also take a look on specific parts of the mesh. And as I mentioned, this algorithm is quite um, intelligent. So he's, for example, automatically defining the mesh here on the near of small holes which was also important so because we need here some extra accuracy since we will have here a lot of changes in the physics. 
and when the mesh is computed, you can also get here a, a message of success. And there's also a tool you can use for take a look inside the mesh, which we call a mesh clock filter. As you can imagine, this will just cut the mesh. This can take up to several seconds because this needs to be also to be computed. And right now we can see here the mesh itself. And as I mentioned, this automatic meshing tool is doing some intelligent refinements. Yes, so as a next step, we can start to set up the simulation itself. So switch to simulation design and I've prepared a simulation one already because I don't want to, to wait for the results, but let's start again from scratch. We will create a new simulation. And then first of all, SimScale asks us which kind of analysis we want to do. And we want to do a thermostructural analysis and we'll just take a look at heat transfer. And he also asks us if we want to do a steady state or transient simulation. Steady state is kind of a snapshot uh, and uh, transient means you're really taking at a, at a, a, a time dependent, look at a time dependent process. We're just interested in the snapshot and the end result, so we'll do, do steady state. And then we have to choose the mesh we want to use for this simulation. And now there are three steps which we have to do until we get our simulation results. First of all, this is an assembly, as I mentioned, of uh, different, um, of different um, parts. And I mean, for us, it's obvious. If we just take a look, that these parts are connected all somehow. But SimScale, our code, does not know that. So first of all, you have to tell him that which car parts are connected how. And for example, here, if we take a look only on these two parts, then you can see that here, this two phase, this phase is is one of the intersection faces, and this face is an intersection phase. And now for all these points where these paths are touching, we have to define the so-called contact. Without the contact, there will be no heat distribution between these two parts. They will not be physically connected, the result will be wrong. And for this, uh, I would recommend you to use so-called topological entity set. A topological entity set is just that you group faces, several faces, and give them a new alias name, a dummy name. For example, uh, this is all prepared, but if we would hide everything, and you can show it, this only contains that face. And this is, by the way, The face I was talking about, slave one, is this face here. And if you take a look then at master one, here, this is where the nut is connected. And then you have also to define a second slave master combination for the connection to this, 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 this heating ring, and so on and so on. I uh, don't intend you just add contacts here. For example, contact one, use bounded contact, and then you just say slave one, master one, sorry, master one here, slave one here. And then these two faces are connected. And you have to do that with all slave master systems. I don't will perform it now because it can take some time and it's the same thing, but later on we'll provide you after this session with the step-by-step -step tutorial where you'll find also less exactly of which face you have to connect 
using this contact and why you have to connect them. Next step would be then to add a material or to choose which materials your partner made from. And by default, these values here are for steel. And since our parts in this case are made of steel, we will just use add it to all volumes. But basically, you can use hundreds of different materials in one assembly group. Next step is to define the temperature, or the surrounding temperature. This temperature, 239 Kelvin is 20 degrees Celsius. So this is a standard, standard temperature. And then you can just decide to define temperatures on heat fluxes. Temperature means that you define which temperature the surface has. In heat flux, you're defining, this, uh, you're saying this is a surface which can exchange heat with its environment. So this is a kind of heat input and this is a kind of, or this will result in inner heat output. And if you want to set up our simulation right now, only thing we have to do is to add a temperature. For example, this is, by the way, the hole where we will put in the, 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 the thermal structure with the resistor. So we can just choose this phase. Or use the face group I created before, which is this one if you select it, and just add the temperature here, like for example 400 Kelvin, which is more than 100 degrees Celsius. And for all the outer surfaces, these are the only surfaces which are in interaction with the air around, we'll just add a heat flux. Also prepared a face group here external surfaces and we will use a heat flux of, uh, of uh, uh, sorry connect the heat flux and this is much too high for air use a convect, uh, convective coefficient of 5 watt per square meter Kelvin Finally, we don't have to touch the numerics. We go now set up the solver. Here we can decide on the number of steps. We'll just do one step. We will use four calls and define the maximum runtime of one hour. Okay, now the last step you can do is something like add a result control, but by default all results are added here. So here you can see which result will be calculated. And finally, you just have to create a new run. And then you can start the simulation run. So let's do a quick wrap up. I showed you just basically what topological sets are so that you can connect or group several surfaces. We then talked about contacts, which are very important to tell some scale which parts are connected how. And without this context, you will also have wrong results for the, for the heat distribution. Then we also discussed, or I showed you how to define a material, how to apply it to the volumes of your simulation. And then we talked about the initial conditions, which is something like, let's say, the, the initial state of a simulation, and about the boundary conditions, which uh, in the end defining the interaction between the model and the environment. Finally, we did some solver setting. We choose the number of processors we want to use, and then we can start the simulation. And there will also be a lot of advanced topics we could talk about, like transient simulations, numerical solver setting, and advanced solver settings. But since this is really hands-on and not very important for most of the cases, uh, it makes more sense to, to, to focus first on the really fundamental things. Right. After you create a simulation run, you can just start it. This will take up to 10 minutes. Therefore, I already prepared a simulation result here, where we have exactly the same boundary conditions. And when your simulation is, is, is finished, you just get a notification. 
And then you can first of all take a look at the so-called solve lock. And the solve lock shows you what in the end the code is doing. Here you see that the job is finished and the size of your result. And then you can switch to our online post processor. And post processing means in the end that you are analyzing the results uh, uh, of your simulation. This can be done with in the SimScale platform web based or also locally. So first of all, we have to choose the simulation one. I prepared two different runs of different temperatures. Uh, and if you click on solution fields, then you get access to the 3D simulation results. And now he's adding the results to this processing field. And here you can see now the simulation. First of all, we have to do change we can change what we want to, to visualize for example if we want to visualize temperature you can see here now the temperature distribution and red means hot about 400 kelvin which is 120 degrees celsius and very blue means 385 degrees which is still like um let's say also um yes 18 degrees, 18 degrees about our environment. And here you can really see how the heat is distributed within this part. And then you can, for example, add a filter, like doing a clip or a cut. A cut. And then we can cut through this solid part. For example, let's say we want the y-axis as a normal. And we just have to change the normal here, apply it, and then we can make the rest invisible. And then we can take a look inside this part here. And then it's the same. We can just, for example, change the temperature. And then we can see the temperature distribution. So here we would have the resistor. We assume, therefore, this inner phase as, as very hot, 400 Kelvin. And then we can see how the heat is distributing. And it's becoming cooler and cooler if you go away uh, in that direction. And this is not um, optimal at this point. The reason for this is, first of all, that we uh, here could make simulation better by adding also uh, heat flux here, because heat is uh, absorbed by the, by the wire. And for sure, uh, redesigning, for example, here, uh, the, uh, the structure of this, this, this cooling plate would also help. And for example, now we can also take a look, if you want to, at the heat distribution here around the sensor. And we can see, first of all, it's quite uniform, which is good. And on the other hand, we can see the difference, which is about 5 to 10 Kelvin. And if you would now do the simulation for different, let's say, um, uh, in, uh, uh, temperatures on this surface, then we could get a kind of feeling for how this is changing, what the sensor is measuring. Yes, to wrap this up, um, Yes, I just showed you how to check if simulation worked, if the convergence is working. Take a look at the, take a look at the, the lock. We also talked about slices and cuts, um, but this was just a very rough general um, simulation uh, post processing. Uh, so we could do a lot of more things like derivate additional quantities. We could do two-dimensional plots showing how the temperature distribution is changing within the material. What would here maybe also make sense is something like calculating average, average temperatures on surfaces. But there are a lot of opportunities. And you are all invited to, to uh, try it, to share your ideas with us. Great. OK. so. Two things. First of all, I would like to discuss your homework assignment with you. 
and after that I will um, or we'll have time for question and answers. Yes, after the session, probably tomorrow afternoon, you will get an email including a link to the record of the session and also to all the information resource need for the homework. And your homework is to do the simulation as I just did before, exactly the same setup, just simulated for four different temperatures. And then to take a look how this affects. So level one is to create the tetrahedral mesh, which is very easy as I showed to you, and level two is to set up the simulation for four different resistor temperatures. When you've done this homework, we'll provide you, by the way, with a very detailed step-by-step -step instruction. So this is really that's not easy, but everybody can do it. And when you finish your homework within one week, you just will have to copy or to send us a link to your project. And if you do all three homeworks, as I mentioned, you will get a free professional training. Okay, great. Then it's time now for your questions. If you have any questions, please just write them into um, the, the question box and I will answer them step by step. Okay, first of all, Christoph asks if there's possibility to simulate radiative heat transfer. And yes, this is possible. Um, you maybe saw it during the um, boundary condition definition that you can hear for heat flex, for example. Um, also, okay, choose radiation. And there are also some different uh, options for for the for the um, uh, let's say uh, heat source. For example, you can change here the temperature and also ramp the value and so on. I hope that answered your question. Next question is by Michael. I hope I pronounce the, the name the right way. Sorry. And you want to know uh, how to simulate effect of fan blowing on the cold end. And that's a very good question. In the last stage, what you are talking about it would, is the CHT. So it's the interaction between a, a heating process and the flow process. And what we did right now, we just assumed a uniform value for the convective um, coefficient on the all external surfaces. If you want, to, to uh, measure the, let's say, the, the effect of blowing on the cold end, the first step would be to use a different flux, for example, in this area here. And later on, you could also do is a fluid flow simulation of the cooling process and couple it with this thermal simulation. Sebastian wants to know if it's possible to measure the temperature in the sensor area. And Sebastian, yes, this is absolutely possible. There are different ways for this. Um, for example, let's do it locally because all the post-processing uh, I did now in the cloud, we can also do it uh, locally. Let's just download first the results. And then we can measure this. Um, okay. Then I will just show you how you can measure this locally. Just go on the documents. I'll download the file here. Then we can see again the sensor and, for example, the temperature distribution. And if you now would like to measure this temperature in the sensor area here, for example, you can just do a cut here. Let me just choose the Yes. And then if you put this legend on and change from temperature, 
then you can see the temperature here is approximately 340. And you can also get values back, but for this you have to set up a so-called result control item before. Next question is by Isaac. Isaac wants to know uh, that he found out that the most time consuming issue is defining context of an assembly. And he wants to know if there is uh, some uh, way he can find out or uh, read how to do this correctly. Um, yes, Isaac, you're right, this is a looking quite complex, this topic, but don't be afraid. Basically, you just have to define a contact between every two parts which are intersecting. So in this case, uh, between all these four parts. And if you have questions regarding this contact definition, first of all, we will send you, or I will send to you all a step-by-step -step tutorial so where we are, I will also explain a little more detail, but you can also just go on our SimScale website on learning and there is documentation. And here just use for contact. And then step by step you can go and here he's explaining again how this context should be defined. And every time you have a question, just take a look at documentation. And if your question is an answer there, you can also take a look at our SimScale forum, where you will also get free instant help here. Tom wants to know if we can do a time-based analysis. Yes, that's possible. That is what I call transient simulation. This is a little bit more complex, but you can do it. And if you're interested in that, I would like to invite you just to try it. And I and my colleagues will help you to get the simulation set up as fast as possible. Sebastian has a next question. He wants to know how it comes that we only performed one meshing operation. Also, there were five independent parts. Sebastian, if you take a look at the geometry, you're right. We're talking about we have four uh, solids but they are all part of one document, of one step file. And as I mentioned, our meshing tool, automatic meshing tool is intelligent, and he detects that this is assembly, and then is meshing all volumes and not only one of them. Um, Torsten wants to know if it's possible to change the heat link between two components. Yes, that is basically possible. Right now, we are assuming that there is, let's say, a perfect contact between them. If you want to change that, you have to use another analysis type, which is then not called anymore uh, heat transfer, but uh, standard, but heat transfer advanced. So, just to give you an example, if you want to, to change this, you just click on simulation designer, new simulation, then turn the structural advanced. And then you can also make it time dependent here. And if you then have uh, contacts, for example, um, then you have more options here. And you can also change for sure the, um, or just play around with the material properties of the parts. Okay, if there are any more questions, we have still some time. Okay, guys, looks like all your questions are answered. Again, I would really like to, to thank you for, for being here. It was a really a big, big... Oh, okay, sorry, last question. Uh, what are the limitations due the, uh, to memory and computing power? Question by Christian. Christian, and basically there are no limitations. You can start as many simulations in parallel you want. Our only limitation right now is that your simulation should not contain more than 60 million elements. 
and the simulation we did right now had maybe several thousands. And you can use maximum of 32 cores. But for most of the applications, it shouldn't be a big problem because 60 million is really a lot. Um, Martin wants to know if uh, the contact area change through thermal deformation can be respected. Yes, that's possible. But then we're talking about another analysis type again. Then we would have uh, uh, uncoupled thermomechanical analysis. Okay, great. If you have any other questions, just send me an email. My email address is mmafiatsimska.com. Thank you very much again for being here. I would love to see you all next week here. Please do all your homework. It's really help will help you a lot, and you will understand a lot of things we discussed today. And yes, hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, just reach out to me or use our forum. Guys, have a nice weekend. Bye.